back uh, this shot showing you lower Manhattan and everything is actually in pretty good shape now. Bright sunny skies, 65 degrees at 7 o'clock in the morning and sunny and pleasant for the rest of the day, 80 degrees. It's kind of a guilty pleasure as beautiful as this weather is going to be. Michael Jordan has finally given some substance to those reports of a comeback. It's early this Tuesday morning, the 11th of September, 2001. New York City, beautiful day here, 80 degrees today. St. Louis. Now, here's what's happening in your neighborhood. Thank you, Tony. Good morning. I'm meteorologist Bill Evans, and our neighborhood has bright sunshine outside. The footage you just finished watching was taken from news broadcasts across New York City on September 11th, 2001, before the first plane hit. The events of 9-11 would change how we live forever. Things didn't change just for those in New York City, but for people all over the world. A truly dark day in our history where we were all under attack and nobody knew when the devastation would end. I laughed louder than I looked up and all of a sudden it smashed right dead into the center of the World Trade Center. When you think of September of 2001, it can be really hard to not associate it with the terror attacks that occurred on September 11th. But the truth is that that day started out just like any other. News outlets were going crazy over Jordan's possible return to the NBA. Jay-Z would release one of the most important albums of his career that same day. And for a lot of people, if you ask anyone, they remember exactly what they were doing when they heard the news. I remember being in school and I was walking through the hallways going to my next class. A good friend of mine informed me that a plane had just hit the tower. And my response to him was, okay, but can you give me my CD back because I gotta get to my next class. You see, in my head, I really couldn't register what he was talking about. Like most people, I assumed it was a small plane and that it was accidental, before the horrific truth was finally learned. While first responders were downtown trying to find people among the wreckage, there was one family in Queens, New York, whose 9-11 nightmare was just beginning. Today on Evil Intentions, the story of Henrik Shiviak. Henryk Szewiak was a Polish man who resided in the Queens section of New York City. As a child, Henryk was described by his sister as a kid full of energy who loved to learn. He would often find himself diving into books on everything from anthropology to physics and anything science. There were times where Henryk wouldn't wake up for class, he would just oversleep. But the teachers were so used to Henryk's participation that they would travel to his home to go wake him up. He loved having his head in books and absorbed all the information like a sponge. Now life in Poland was a completely different world from what New York City was, and this is what Henrik called home. Growing up, Henrik had a great relationship with his family and was devoted to them. They would do everything together from celebrate holidays to celebrating name days, a tradition in Poland and a fond memory the family had of Henrik. Over the years as he became an adult, he would serve two years in the Polish army before becoming a railroad inspector for the Polish Rails Network. At the tender age of just five years old, Henrik would meet a little girl named Eva. Eva's family lived next door to Henrik since she was there visiting on vacation. The two would meet and they would instantly become inseparable. They were best friends. And what they didn't know is that later on in life, they would also end up getting married. Eva was later a student who would get her PhD in biology and later teach biology to high school students. Henrik and Eva would welcome two children into the world. First, their daughter, followed by their son a few years later. Henrik was ecstatic at the idea of being a father. He had dreams of doing everything possible for his family. Step one to that was Henrik's dreams of building a house with his own hands for him and his family to call their own, something he had experience with doing back in Poland. Henrik had big dreams, and he was determined to make things happen for himself but it wouldn't be as easy here as it was back in Poland. He would need the money and the materials to help him build. This is when Henrik's sister Lucina, who was already in New York City at the time, would help him come over to get his plans into motion, and Henrik would end up making the life-changing move to the Big Apple. Lucina was already in New York due to some issues with her private business back home. There was an unfortunate fire and the business suffered. So while she wasn't exactly crazy about leaving the place she called home, she also understood that she needed to change things in order to progress. So she set her sights on New York City and came to the city in 1994. 
Lucina understood what it felt like to miss your friends, family, and land when you're in a brand new place. So, she wanted to make this transition as smooth as possible for her brother. Henrik would arrive in New York City around the year 2000, where he would reside in the Far Rockaway section of Queens, New York with his sister at first, then getting a place of his own on the same block as his sister. When Henrik arrived in New York City, he was already in his mid-40s, and his children were becoming young adults, his daughter turning 17, and his son was only 10. It wasn't easy to be so far from those he loved, but Henrik made it work and he made sure to contact them every single day. That way, the connection and bond the family had was never lost. His body was in New York, but Henrik's mind and heart were in Poland. While in New York City, Henrik worked a number of jobs from construction work to any other job that was available. He had just been laid off from work at a construction gig, and he searched through a Polish newspaper, seeking what might be available in terms of new employment. Normally, every last cent he made, he sent it back home. He was focused on setting him and his family up nicely so that they were comfortable in the future. Henrik was extremely focused, and he knew exactly what he wanted out of this huge life change, and he was well on course to getting it. During Henrik's time in New York City, he would often have conversations with his sister, where the two would discuss everything from things they missed back home to Henrik's future dreams of building a home. During one of those talks, Henrik would talk about a dream or premonition he had, a premonition that involved him passing away soon. This wasn't the first time Henrik would mention something in relation to him dying, but sometimes we just say things in a playful manner or without much meaning behind it. But there are many who believe words like these have power. Sometimes it can feel as if someone is manifesting these outcomes without wanting to. We see it often when an interview or an old song resurfaces of certain artists, for example. Their music might describe something so eerily accurate that one can't help but ask themselves, if these people knew what would eventually come to them, and how. Just a few days after having one of those talks with Lucina, a talk about his own demise, the world would wake up on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, and not one person, including Henrik, could imagine what was coming later on that day. That morning, at around 7 a.m., Henrik made his way to work as he normally would, but less than two hours later, at exactly 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 would crash directly into the North Tower. What was first thought to be an accident would be quickly branded as a true terrorist attack when a second plane, United Airlines Flight 175, would crash into the South Tower at 9.03 a.m. Henrik, who'd witnessed one of the planes hit the towers, phoned his family back in Poland to let them know that he was safe. But if you weren't in New York City that day, it can be hard to put into words just how hectic the city was and just how fearful of more attacks the people were. Glass and tons of other debris, much of it on fire, would come crashing down below as people ran for their lives, in complete disbelief at what just happened. Thousands of lives lost in an instant, and this was only the start of it. The intense fires would force people to make a choice, either burn in the towers, or take matters into their own hands, and go the way they chose. Many would choose the latter, jumping from the towers to their deaths, what would normally be considered the very busy financial district was converted into the city's biggest crime scene, and there was no telling when the carnage would end. As that day went on, every single officer and first responder would be called down to the towers, many of them coming back from vacation and some not even expecting to be in that day. The 911 calls poured in by the thousands, many of the call takers on the other end not knowing what to say or how to respond to those who had absolutely no chance of making it out alive when the towers both came crashing down. Nearby hospitals had staff, equipment, and they were ready for whatever came their way, but it would take hours before anyone showed up with injuries because there were barely any survivors, undoubtedly the darkest day in our history for many. While nearly 3,000 people would die in the attacks in New York City that day, this was considered a mass casualty. It wasn't a straightforward murder, but when the towers were already on the ground and just about every first responder was down there looking for survivors, a call would be made to 911 about the one murder in New York that day, and the call was coming from Brooklyn, New York. Henrik's sister never saw him that day, but they knew he was safe. They knew he made it through the events of 9-11, but he was in the process of finding directions to a new job he'd landed in Brooklyn, New York. The job involved cleaning at a supermarket for a cleaning service. And while it wasn't much, Henrik already had his mind set on taking every last opportunity he could to make money so that he could send it back to his family. This evening job would be a second gig to help him save money faster. 
Henrik would borrow a map from his landlady, a woman by the name of Anna Sadowska, a map to help him find his way to the location. He already knew his way around the subway system when it came to Queens and Manhattan, but Brooklyn was a different world for him. The trip should have taken him from Queens, New York all the way to Nostrand Avenue in Brooklyn, but at some point after arriving, Henrik would apparently become lost, and he never made it. Henrik was wearing an army jacket with matching pants this night. He wore this on purpose because he'd never met anyone from the new job, and he wanted to be recognizable. He said what he'd be wearing and went on his journey. September 11th would be Henrik's first time traveling to Brooklyn. He ventured off, not knowing just how dangerous the area he was headed really was. He would arrive at the Nostrum station sometime after 11. We may never know if Henrik was simply lost or if something made him go in that direction, but what is known is that a 911 call was made around 11.30 p.m. The location was Decatur Street near Albany Avenue. The area, especially back then, was an entirely different place, known for being crime-ridden and somewhere you didn't want to be when the sun sets. A place where even visiting the 79th precinct might pose a threat, since the area that surrounded was plagued by violence and was so unpredictable. People described hearing lots of commotion and the sounds of people arguing. Whatever happened next is a mystery, but seven shots would ring out. Henrik was shot in the chest twice, one of the bullets tearing through his lung. As Henrik stumbled, he would begin to bleed out profusely, leaving a trail of blood behind him. He would make his way up a flight of stairs at the front of a tenement building, where he knocked for help. Every second that went by was crucial, but nobody answered. Residents more than likely feared becoming victims themselves after hearing shots ring out and after seeing what they saw. Whether it be out of pure fear of retaliation or the fear of being seen as a snitch, nobody had information on what actually transpired. His life was fading quickly, and as he tried to make his way down the stairs, he was stumbled down and land face down on the sidewalk. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Resources were so scarce that day that only one detective was sent to the scene. Even the team sent to collect shell casings and collect the evidence at the crime scene were from a different division. They were from the evidence collection unit, who normally handled crime scenes like burglaries, and the process wasn't as intricate as it would be if the crime scene unit had been sent. But on 9-11, it was the best they could do. While a hate crime wasn't seriously considered when it came to this case, Henrik's family believed there's a chance that his appearance that night might have played a crucial role. Due to what Henrik was wearing, an army jacket and pants, and his inability to communicate due to a language barrier, he might have been mistaken for someone as Middle Eastern. Someone who wanted to inflict pain onto an individual they didn't even know, thinking they were doing some sort of service to the city. When in reality, they took the life of a man who had nothing but a dream to take care of his family. In the weeks that followed, this tragedy would only become more and more buried in the shadow of the devastating attacks that day. While Henrik's case would continue to go mostly unknown and unsolved, his family would plan for his burial back home in Poland. Strangely, one of the priests at the wake looked so much like Henrik that the family couldn't help but be shocked. They would even joke that this was Henrik overseeing his own funeral. In this moment of tragedy and confusion, the joke served as a relief and brought a sense of calm to the family. Weeks would turn into months, and months would turn into years. Those years would then become decades, as 2022 marks 21 years, with no information and no closure for this family. Every year on the anniversary of September 11th, thousands of names are read in memory of those lost in the attacks. Henrik's family doesn't get remembered the same way. They don't receive flowers in memory of Henrik. They don't receive televised memorials to help them cope. They're simply left with the thoughts of that dark day in 2001, one of the most horrific days in our history. The day that Henrik Syriac lost his life, and he lost it to a different type of terror altogether. The terror that is and always has been the streets of New York, a senseless and unspeakable tragedy. Here's to hoping that someone, anyone out there with any information, comes forward even if it's anonymously, to help get this family the closure that they deserve, and to remember a man with the same dream as a lot of us, a dream to just live. Rest in peace to Henrik Shiviak, and my deepest condolences go out to his family and loved ones.